Good evening and welcome to the policy subcommittee meeting of the Brockton School Committee. Today is Tuesday, April 26th and the time being 5.38 p.m. Uh, I'd like to establish a quorum. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Here. Mr. Homer. Here. Mrs. Sullivan. Here. And the chair is here. Thank you. So uh, we do have a quorum. The first item on the agenda is discussion and potential vote on BPS Special Education Policies and Procedures Manual. I believe we have Laurie Mason presenting this evening Sharon. and Sharon Walder. Uh, Ms. Mason is going to go first. Thank you. Anyway. Good evening. Okay, should I press the, okay, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Laurie Mason, the Director of Special Ed. Um, nice to meet you, Jared. Um, so we um, are required to have a policies and procedures manual for special education. And this policy and procedures manual really walks through parents and school staff about the process for special education. So we talk about the first part of it, we give the parents rights and we have that in multiple languages. Um, and then we kind of walk through the important aspects of special education. When a parent refers a child, um, when a school refers a child, timelines, um, what the process is for the special education department, the information we gather from the schools, and we really walk through mandated state and federal guidelines and then also um, looking at what the process is for the IEP. Um, we have a lot of information in here. Um, and you know, I'm sure you can read it at your leisure. But this is really just highlighting what what needs to be in place for staff and for families. The second um, packet that I gave you is really what I share with teachers on what is special education. Um, sorry, I need to put my glasses on. What is special education? How is it determined? It's almost like a special education in a nutshell so it's this document is really all about the big procedures manual um, you know age limits evaluation process timelines options for parents and then at the end um, a few years back and probably like five years ago I created a parent uh, IEP checklist for parents so at every team meeting parents receive this checklist um, and it's really um, it's a flow, it's kind of flows through the IEP process. So parents will, will go through, this is the IEP and you know, we, they circle yes or no. They typically will sit next to somebody in the school that they're very familiar with, the special ed teacher or the classroom teacher or school adjustment counselor. And we, they just answer the questions to make sure that the process is followed. And it's, a, it, and it's something for the parents to take with them. Um, and it's, it's really been helpful to help with the understanding of the IEP process. Because it is overwhelming for parents to come to a meeting with, you know, could be 10 people at a table talking about their child. Um, you know, it's really, a, it's really to help with the process. So. So, um, sorry, a quick no, question. Please. So, um, how long does the process normally take? Or are we gonna go over that shortly? So, when we, a parent, we, um, request a team meeting or a school request a team meeting from the time they sign their evaluation consent it's 30 to 45 days for the school the child to be evaluated the team to meet write the IEP and present it to the parents so it's a 30 to 45 day window so typically we're running our team meetings on the 35th or 36th day of that process um, because we want to make sure that we give the full 30 days to evaluate the child. And we like to use that full 30 days to make sure that the evaluation is comprehensive. Um, and sometimes it takes multiple days and times to evaluate a student. We don't want a child to sit with one special ed evaluator for four or five hours during a day, so we'll spread it over a period of time. Um, when the parents are at the team meeting, um, before the team meeting, they get their evaluations two days in advance. They're able to review them on their own, and then they come with questions. Um, and the process for determining whether a child has a disability is that the team presents the information. 
we follow the Massachusetts flow chart, which is in the procedures manual of does your child have a disability? Do they require specialized instruction? How is that impacting their education? So the two things that we really, I mean, testing is, is you know, pretty concrete data, but really looking at and getting information from the parent and the classroom teacher. Classroom teachers are with the children, students every day. Parents are with their kids every day. So getting a lot of that information to help drive where are we going, where, where are we going with this, with the IEP, if there is an IEP. Um, and then we provide the parent at the meeting a summary of is your child have a disability? Are they going to receive services? In what areas? And what does that look like? And then typically we take up to 10 days to get the IEP to the parent. Um, I just have, an, I have another quick question. Sure. I don't mean to keep interrupting. No. If any of the members have any questions up until now, I can um, call upon you. So um, what is the percentage of the, the amount of parents that actually go through the process? As far as our students, what is the percentage? Are we seeing that those that are going through this process to see if their child needs an IEP, is it the majority, they, they do need an IEP, or are we offering something? If they don't qualify for this, there is a backup as far as providing them with help, extra help that they might need. So I don't actually have the percentage. However, the schools have what we call an IST process, which is an instructional support teams. So any child that is struggling, a teacher can bring them forth to this team, and they're going to look at what is the area the child is struggling is? What can we do for interventions? And they're going to provide interventions and take data. And so typically, if the student is not responding to that intervention, then they remove that child through the IEP process. We're finding that students that go through the IST process and really have strong interventions that are done with consistency and you know, or, or validity, that we're qualifying students because they're not responding to the intervention. Um, if a parent requests an evaluation, we still, we generate the consent, but we still bring the child to IST just to see if there's anything else in the interim we can do for the child and provide some interventions and share that information. Um, I think children are struggling. We've been, since March of 2020, kids have been not in school consistently. Children are struggling and the schools are really looking at what interventions can we put in place before we get to special education. Um, schools offer varying um, intervention programs through either Title I or we have assistants in the building that are pulling small groups. Our gen ed teachers are also doing interventions within the classroom. Um, in some of the schools we utilize their special ed teacher to do groups with students in the classroom that present as at risk to get a gauge on providing the intervention to see, oh, do we need to move this child through the, through the IEP process or the team meeting process. No, definitely. Um, we do hear from a lot of parents, and it just it's, it's definitely a process. I'm asking some of the questions. I might yes. already know the answers, but a lot of the people that are watching don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I like to sometimes ask a question. That way you can explain it thoroughly. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, did you have a question? Okay. Mrs. Sullivan? Um, but it is up to the parents to request it. Or the school. So if the school is, or a school is finding that a teacher or a school adjustment counselor or even principals will refer students for evaluations because right. the, if they're struggling. Right. But the parent also, yes. Okay. The parent also requests. So this information here, would the parents get this? Or? The policy and procedure, that will be on our website. Okay. And then um, through the CPAC, this will, out, this will go to Terry. For the CPAC, okay. We'll so this, this one here this would go to parents. I call it special education in a nutshell. So right, okay. Because we know that they would never read all this. Some may, <laughs> and we will have we will have it translated just for the purpose. I didn't, yeah. You know, for tonight. Um, yes. Yeah, so so we, they would get this packet here. Okay. Yes, and they all receive the parent um, IEP checklist because we do. I do. You know, I send them to the teachers, and they send them out to the. Um, to the parents via email. That was one of the things through the pandemic that our communication with our families is stronger because we have everyone, you know, utilize email and, right. um, and teams so it was easier to get information to our families. Right, but previous to us having this, what did we give parents? Because I know there was information out there because, I mean, my children went through the process and I'm familiar with the process and right now we have a little 
you know, packet, but before I know there was information that... There was information shared. So at the, school, at the school, share a lot of information with parents. So if a parent, you know, calls the school and says, my child is struggling, or if a teacher is noticing a child is struggling, they're right. going to reach out to the family first. Yeah. We, listen, we, I'm concerned. We have a process we want to bring up to our team to talk about doing some interventions. And so there's that first part of communication. You know, we don't want parents to hear from special ed first because we want them to hear from the school-based teams first. So we're providing a lot of trainings and in-services for our gen ed teachers to be able to share information with our families. Right, right, thank you. And can I say, I'm sorry. It's okay, Mr. Homer. Sorry, thank you. I was just gonna ask how we're we doing with um, translation services for families and interpretation services. Are, are you finding, are there any languages that are not being served as well or that you need more support in terms of providing language support, translation support? So I utilize Bay State um, Translation and they, we have a variety of um, translators. Um, through the IEP process, through Easy IEP, we have documents are automatically translated in multiple languages and the, the ones that they are not able to translate, I use Bay State and I have a really good turnaround with um, you know, with translation packets. Um, and we always have interpreters at the team meetings, we utilize that service. And they've been great. They've been, I've been using them probably, how long, probably eight, right. seven or eight years. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar, we use Bay State in the school district that, that I work in. We, um, we've sometimes had them participate by phone too. Do you have, yes. They, yes. They, they phone in remotely we and participate? Remote okay. and in, in person. So during the, obviously during the times when we did all our meetings virtually, right. they were, Right. meeting virtually are parents able to participate remotely yes yeah, so okay. right now um, we have we are giving parents options of in-person or virtual depending so during the the time when school was mostly virtual parents participated they will be at work and say hey I can I I'm taking my lunch I'm gonna do this virtually is that okay absolutely we always allow we give parents an option um, of coming in person and I just actually had a principal call me early and say this parent wants their team meeting virtual tomorrow. I said, no problem. I think that gives parents opportunities to not have to take the day off from work and it gives them a chance to, because many people are very accommodating um, and allowing them to do it during their lunch break or from their cars, because a lot of our families are doing it from their cars. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one thing I do want to add, we've, we have a different special education structure um, where um, department heads are housed in buildings and have are, are responsible for you know three or four schools and having the department heads housed in those buildings and, and only working with certain amount of certain schools it's allowed for more communication with the staff about what the special education process is and not and then the parents also it's kind of streamlined the process a little bit I just want to acknowledge um, Mrs. Ehlers um, was stuck in traffic, so she is joining us um, for the record, so she is um, attending the meeting. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. So, um, awesome. Um, I guess you can continue with your presentation. Nice. I apologize for interrupting, but oh, I just no, didn't want to I forget. like questions. Yeah. I like a lot of questions. I know questions. this is a very, very important, and I know this is um, one of the questions I usually get from a lot of our constituents as far as the IEP process. And, um, you know, a lot of parents are afraid that they don't want their child to fall behind. If there is, if there is um, something that their child needs to go as far as extra assistance when it comes to, you know, uh, the special ed department. So, so I know I, a lot I, of us, this is a, this is probably one of the questions I get all the time is the IEP. Yeah, and I think that um, what a lot of people struggle with is we do follow the Massachusetts guidelines for eligibility. So we have the, the dis you know, different disability categories and when we know a child is struggling but they but they're not eligible through the special education process it's like okay so now what so we're really looking at our schools and looking at what interventions we have in place and what else do we need to do to provide additional interventions for students who do not qualify for special education or to pre you know to preempt it so we what can we do to help them and figure out what their struggles are before we get to special education you know, we don't want any children to have to go through evaluations, unnecessary evaluations. Um, so we want to make sure we put everything in place. And that's constantly a work, a work in progress. That is a work in progress. 
Definitely. Now, do the schools report um, the amount of IEP requests that they get as far as like families? So do you get like a report? So you just don't want a student to fall through the cracks. Like, you know, a parent puts in a request and then, you know, time's gone by and, you know, things haven't been, you know, I get it. We, we, were, we were playing catch up with mm -hmm. everything else um, due to COVID. So do the schools report to the special ed department directly as this is the amount of requests that we've gotten? So we are on very strict timelines. So if a parent does put in a request, um, they typically do it through email. We'll take any text, email, letter. And we only ha we have five days to respond to that. We have five days to get that evaluation consent to the parent. And typically, we like to talk to the parent first to say, you know, what are your concerns? But that doesn't always happen. So if we are not able to communicate with a parent within the first two days, we're generating the consent, and we're getting that out to the family. And through our easy IEP process, they're automatically emailed, and we also hard copy mail. And then we do, we have, having the department heads housed in those buildings and that structure, we have a department head and a team chair, team chairs have two schools that they're focusing on. There's a lot of communication if, if um, when schools say, you know, we put in some requests, where are we in that process? Um, and so we do, and we keep the track of how many initial evaluations we have and we're, we're following that process. Thank you. It's also important to note that um, once a parent requests or a school requests that a child be evaluated, um, you, uh, by law, um, you have to treat that child as a special education student. Yes. Uh, anything you do with discipline, um, any supports, interventions, uh, even though they might not have an official IEP signed because they're going through the evaluation process, once the parent signs the consent, um, that student is deemed to be special education and you need to follow all the special education laws uh, with discipline, reporting their attendance. Um, so, you know, principals and assistant principals and leaders of buildings, you know, know that. And again, whether it's either the parent that's requesting uh, an evaluation or the school, once that evaluation is requested, that child is deemed to be special education. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying and actually providing that extra info for us. Again, we have a lot of parents that are watching this evening, so, and a lot of them just don't know where to start sometimes. And just so they know that they have, this is in place. This is, this is what it's all about as far as trying to get our students the help that they need. Um, so. And parents can call our office. I speak to parents pretty much all day long, and, you know, I enjoy that part of my job, communicating with families. But... All the people that work in my office, they know the process. So if a parent calls and says, you know, my child's struggling, what do I need to do? They're able to explain the process, and then we can get the ball rolling for, the, for them. Um, this is, this policy, this procedures manual is really important for even for, our, just for our district, to, even for leaders and our teachers and support staff to be able to walk through and say, this is what the process looks like. It really talks about from the beginning to the end you know, the, the pre-referral, the referral, the consent, the evaluation, what do services look like? And this past, well, this school year, we're still in this school year, and next year, we're really looking at how are we providing services that maximize for kids. We're looking at service delivery in a different lens. We want to make sure that we're capturing all the student, the, what the student needs within that gen ed setting. Because the law really is very, um, strict about least restrictive environment, making sure the students are educated in their gen ed classroom. So our responsibility is to make sure we're providing them enough supports to be able to access the curriculum, make progress, make effective progress, and that's the most important thing. Um, so we're really looking at service delivery, and we've been looking at it over the past couple of years. Mrs. Sullivan? Also, tell them about the uh, CPAC meeting, because if parents are interested and they're wondering tonight, the CPAC has loads of information for this type of thing. And we do uh, monthly meetings. I typically at the, the next beginning meeting is? Is in May. It's, a tr it's actually our transition meeting. So at the beginning of the school year, I do a, um, a presentation on regulations, state and federal laws. What does it look like? What does special education look like? Our process. And we, I did that in September or October. I think it was September. Our next meeting is in May, um, and it's on transition. So we, this is the time of year when kids are transitioning. We're transitioning from different levels, preschool to kindergarten, fifth grade to sixth grade, eighth grade to ninth grade. And, and parents get very nervous 
about what that tr transition looks like, and we try to set up transition meetings. And as today, my department heads actually met and talked about transition plans, transition forms that they want to create. So when a student transitions from one level to another, that they they have a, a packet or a piece of paper that kind of highlights the different um, the different areas that they are strong, they have strengths, and what they need to work on. Um, and then in June, Terry McIntosh and I have not really set a date for June because we're trying to, we, we want to wait and see um, what the next topic is that we want to do. So. Right, so the meetings, I, you can go on Facebook and, yep. and like the CPAC page. Yes, and S -E -P, we have it posted on our broadcast. And then Facebook Terry posts. posts when the meetings are. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So for those that are um, watching this evening, I actually, I was looking for the CPAC page because I know I have you on my Facebook um, to give that address to those that are watching. Um, if you know it offhand, and, and Mrs. McIntosh is absolutely wonderful. She is wonderful. Um, she's such a sweet person, and we're lucky to have, have her as well helping out. Um, I know I've, anytime a parent has any questions, we're like, you've got to reach out to Mrs. McIntosh. Um, so do you have that page? Um, do you know the exact, is it the Brockton? It's the Brockton CPAC page. So it's, okay. S, you know, it's the Brockton S-E-P-A-C. B-C, yes. and it will come up. Yeah. Okay. And I just want yeah. people to know that you know, uh, my have I have an open door policy, and people can call me, email me, um, and you know, meet with me. That's I, I like that part of my Thank job. you. And a lot of the families um, do need that extra little hand holding right now, mm -hmm. especially when they're going through that process. Um, any of the uh, members have any questions or comments? Um, I just want to say one other thing. I think sure. that when parents attend team meetings, it's pretty overwhelming, and you know you have a lot of people talking at you. So one of the things we've been really working on is talking to parents and not reading a report. Parents don't need to, you know, have all these numbers thrown at them. It's more about um, this is your child's strengths. These are the areas we need to improve, and this is how we're going to get there. So that's really trying to change the script because it is overwhelming for parents to sit and have you know eight or ten people sitting around a table talking about their child who they're already concerned about. So it's really about changing the script, making it more parent friendly, um, having parents ask more questions. And the parent checklist, I think, helps with that. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, so is that your presentation for this evening? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I, I have a quick question. So I believe this has to go before the policy manual subcommittee before we can vote on it. Because it is being added to, even though it's an update, I could be wrong, but I just want to clarify. Is this brand new or is it this updated? Is, this is an update from a, from a long so time. So where it's an update, I believe they have to compare the changes. But MASC has already updated the manual, right? So all the updates would be in the manual already. And when we go over the special ed section, then we'll, yeah. we will review that. Yep. This is much more detailed. This, this really goes into a lot that's more fine. detail. Yeah, that's fine. With yeah. appendices and. Sharon, do you want to And I'm not on mic, but just so that you know, we run this. Actually, can you come to um, one of the mics? No, just so, yeah. Sure. Just for those that are listening. It's just um, where there's been changes to an existing policy, we have to show the changes, and they need to be approved by the, the policy subcommittee. The policy manual subcommittee, but I, we can get clarification on that. So we are uh, mandated to have this on file and have it uh, available to people and uh, publicly available. And when you look back at what we have, we had our attorney go through this thoroughly and make sure that we have all aspects of what uh, Brockton Public Schools does in terms of special education available. We haven't had one of these uh, put together in many years, and um, I'm going to urge you to not wait um, for other policies, but to move forward on this if you can, because um, we have just completed our tier focus monitoring review with the Department Ed of Education for Special Education, and we want to make sure that everything that we have related to special education is updated and available to our families and communities. So. Um, 
I, your part, your your part is your part, but I just want to make sure that it's really clear that um, to look for old policies and try to connect it to what we have now and do that um, going across and figuring out what um, what changes have been ta have taken place. We've had our attorney go completely where, through this. So I, I apologize um, for interrupting. It's just, but where where is? Without seeing what the changes were. Okay, but we're, we, okay, if the committee's comfortable, I mean, where, where are the changes? Like, we're not actually seeing changes that were made from the previous policy, and this is the current policy. Where's the, like, the red line? Where's, where's that copy to see what was added, what was taken out? As we normally do with a policy manual subcommittee, we see that this is the policy, and then these are the changes, and then they vote on it for us as a committee, which is wonderful. I understand the time-sensitive part of this, mm -hmm. but we would have to, you know, I'd have to talk to the committee and see what they're comfortable. Okay. Whereas we're not seeing the previous policy. Okay. We're just seeing a policy before us. And we're not seeing the additions or, is it fine? The school committee? Okay, then we can, we can probably, if we can get a copy of what the original policy looked like as far as the special ed policies and procedures manual prior to the January 2022 changes. And then um, we can have that provided to our, our committee members and then we can vote on that. Um, if we can add it to the May 3rd, which is next week, does that allow you enough time for us to be able to review it? Mm -hmm. You'd have to get it to um, Mrs. Campbell so we can get it into our packets this weekend. And I, I will say to you, because so much more work has gone into this one, uh, what we have now is significantly more than what we had before. So it won't line up, there's this page and this page and here's what's different. It, there will be things in this manual that didn't exist before. So you need to be clear on that. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we, we understand um, that things have changed. Uh, just curious, when was the last policy? What was the date on that? I want to say like, in the 90s? 90s, <laughs> maybe 2001, so, maybe 1999, so. maybe 2000. 99 or 2003. Yeah. So it has been some time. So we do understand, you know, things have changed. Probably triple the size. Okay. And even with the procedural safeguards, those have changed through the Department of Ed. Yeah. Right. So they used to be parents' rights, which were very different than the procedural safeguards that they have now. So, yeah, I can. I have we no, can send the, the, we the can old look. one. I Absolutely. I mean, that. if any of the committee members have any questions or comments, um, I'm just trying to make sure that you have a clear packet to review on something that we're going to be voting. And there is a time sensitive um, when it comes to this. So, it doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. I mean, if you want to vote on it now, it's up to you. Um, for those that would prefer to see the previous policy, we can leave it up to the committee. Um, I make a motion to accept the Brockton Public Schools Special Education Policies and Procedures Manual. Well, do any members have any questions before we, we put a motion on the table? Okay. Anyone want to second that then? Sorry. So a motion's been made um, and properly seconded. A motion's been made by Mrs. Sullivan and properly seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. Um, we're going to do a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mrs. Ehlers? Yes. Mr. Homer? No. Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. And I, I really would prefer to see the previous policy. Um, I think one week, would that really be much of a delay? No, I think you can, uh, uh, you can amend the motion to say recommended once we you know i don't know we have to figure out how to word it but once you see the form of policy um you recommended it for the it still has to be approved by the full school you, like you, this group is not you're not the final vote the school the full school committee uh, is the final so you can amend the motion to say next week. okay no you can amend it now and say we've you know you know we recommend to the full school committee once we are able to review the 
So have Mrs. Solomon have Mrs. Sullivan amend her motion. Yeah, to, to recommend this um, for final review before the school committee, and then we can take a vote next week. Yeah, but you can say that you might want to put in the motion that um, with the review of the old committee of the old policy. Okay, I'll add to the motion that um, we'll review the old policy. Second. Of the Brockton <laughs> Public Schools Special Ed Policies and Procedurals Manual. Okay. Second. Okay. And I'll, okay. So uh, it was, um, so it was amended by Mrs. Sullivan and it was seconded by Mr. Homer. All in favor will just show or raise a hands. And that's unanimous. Okay. Um, thank you so much. All right. We thank appreciate you. your time. Wonderful. Um, you know, a, a lot of work did go into this. We just want to make sure that, oh. you know, everything's good to go and, and it's next week. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get also, this. also, um, in the, um, in the packet, we'll also uh, include, um, attorney Paige Tobin's, um, contact information. If you have any questions at all, she's, uh, the attorney we've used for years. She's excellent, uh, around special education law. So, um, we'll include her contact information. You'll have her email and her phone if you have any questions at all before Tuesday's meeting. Um, we'll try to get you the information before. I can, we'll get you her, Melinda will send the contact information by email to everybody tomorrow. Um, that way, if you have any questions, you can call her well before a week from now next Tuesday. And then we'll, as soon as we get the, um, the information, we'll email it and also put it in Friday's packet. So if we can get you the older policy earlier, we'll email it to you before Friday, but we'll also put it in Friday's packet. But I will get you Paige's contact information tomorrow and email it to everybody and feel free to call her. Um, she, again, she's the one that leads us through all mm -hmm. our special education policies and laws and she works closely with our principals to make sure that um, they're following the law when it comes to discipline. Um, she covers and works with Sharon or, uh, on bullying policy, civil rights, harassment. So she's, she's the attorney that deals with all that. Great. Thank you so much. And again, a lot, of t a lot was put into this. And we do. It's about time that we, we have this updated. <laughs> so we, we appreciate it. Thank you so all much. Right, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number two on the agenda would be other business. If anyone has any other business um, for the policy subcommittee this evening. I don't see any. Um, okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion has been made by Mr. Homer, probably seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. Um, all in favor? Unanimous. Um, we will be coming back shortly this evening. Um, so it is 6.11. We're going to take probably about a five-minute break, and we will come back um, for finance subcommittee. Thank you.